Yeah. Welcome to Wall Street versus Main Street, a different take on the investment show with our host, Dax White. Dax White is the managing partner of the White Law Group, a national securities fraud, securities arbitration, and investor protection law firm with offices in Chicago, Illinois, and Vero Beach, Florida. The White Law Group has represented hundreds of investors in FINRA arbitration claims against their brokerage firms, and throughout this show, Mr. White will shine a light on some of the tricks of the brokerage industry, while also providing valuable information for investors on how to successfully navigate the investor-financial advisor relationship. Welcome, everyone. You're listening to Wall Street v. Main Street. I'm your host, Dax White. Uh, this is, a, as the intro indicated, this is a different take on the investment program. Uh, I'm not going to be giving investment advice. I'm not a licensed investment professional, but uh, rather a securities attorney that handles litigation cases against brokerage firms. And so the objective of this show is to pass along some of the information that I've learned in that role uh, to sort of try to arm investors with what I think would be valuable information and evening the playing field between the investor and the broker. Um, give, them, give them some of the information that would allow them to have a more productive relationship with their financial advisor and sort of arm you with information that I think would be helpful uh, to make sure that you're not being taken advantage of. So that's the objective of the show. Uh, this week, uh, we're going to try to tackle uh, the difference between a financial advisor and an investment advisor, a very nuanced language difference, but there's, there's actually quite a big difference there. Um, and I think it's one that most, most investors aren't aware of. Um, and so I think it's worth hitting on so that you have a sense of, okay, which one am I dealing with? Is my financial advisor, you know, are they a broker? Are they an investment advisor? Uh, because I think it's important in terms of understanding what are their duties to you? Um, how are they being compensated? And if, if something goes bad, um, what, what are the differences in terms of litigation? So uh, that, that's what we're going to try to tackle today. Um, and, and jumping right in, the first fundamental difference between a financial advisor and a, and a financial advisor is generally someone who works uh, at either a wirehouse like a Morgan Stanley or a Merrill Lynch or even some of these independent firms like Raymond James uh, LPL, Commonwealth, uh, I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of brokerage firms, but but that a financial advisor is somebody who's got a Series 7 license to sell securities, um, and they're, they're regulated by FINRA, um, and they usually work at a brokerage firm. An investment advisor uh, is somebody who is regulated by the SEC, um, and they're compensated differently, and they usually work for what's called a registered investment advisory firm, and, and that affects their duties to you and how they're compensating. We're going to go into those nuances. But um, just uh, broad strokes, that's sort of the, what those two entities are, those two types of uh, professionals. Um, and so the first one, uh, again, has to do with regulation. Uh, brokerage firms are, are self-regulated by what's called FINRA. Uh, and FINRA is literally the self-regulatory body of the brokerage industry. They are paid for by the brokerage industry. Uh, it's a very overt conflict of interest in my view, but it is what it is. That, that's, that's the way it is in our country, is that brokerage firms pay in money to FINRA, and FINRA comes out and audits them and makes sure that they are complying with FINRA and SEC rules. Um, and so if you're with a financial advisor, if you're with a Morgan Stanley or a Wells Fargo or any of those types of firms, your, your, your financial advisor is being regulated by FINRA. Um, if you're with an investment advisor, uh, your your financial advisor or your investment advisor, excuse me, is being regulated by the SEC. Uh, and the difference there, uh, it's nuanced. I mean, both of them have similar rules and uh, both of them have very excellent regulators. Um, but my experience, the, the fundamental and large largest difference there is that the SEC is spread much thinner than FINRA in terms of its supervision. Um, and whether it's a funding issue or... Uh, just a numbers game, I'm not sure, uh, but the reality is investment advisors, in my experience, are not regulated as frequently or as strenuously as FINRA firms. Um, so if you're with an investment advisor, that doesn't that, that's not an indictment on, on them. That doesn't suggest that they are good or bad, but it is of concern to me as somebody who sees fallout, who sees outcome, uh, and always in, in a bad outcome. Uh, it's a concern to me because if you have a bad investment advisor, they are less likely to get caught. 
Um, and so that doesn't mean that FINRA is perfect or that they catch financial advisors in every context, but I, in my experience, they are regulated more strenuously and more regularly. So that's the first fundamental difference. Uh, the, the second one has to do with their duty to you. In the brokerage firm context, uh, while most clients think, oh, my financial advisor has to look out for my best interests, the reality is that the standard that the brokerage firm uh, believes that it has to you is what's called suitabil the suitability standard. Their obligation to you is to make an investment recommendation that is suitable for you. And what's suitable for you is not necessarily always in your best interests. Uh, and, 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 and I'll explain that in an example. Um, let's say that there is a, a mutual fund that would be suitable for you. Uh, you. You want growth and it provides growth and you want large, you know, large stocks in, in making up the mutual fund. That's what this one has. Um, so that this particular mutual fund might be suitable for you. Um, but let's say this mutual fund pays 4% and there's another one with virtually identical investments that pays 1%. The broker in that context doesn't have an obligation to pick the one that pays 1%, which would clearly be in your best interest. They can pick the one that pays 4% because it's suitable. Uh, so that's a very important distinction in terms of their duty to you uh, and, and why, and we touched on it last week in terms of vetting your financial advisor, why it is always important to ask them how they're being compensated and whether or not they consider themselves to have a fiduciary duty to their client. Because this is an industry thing, uh, industry standard in terms of brokerage industry, but that doesn't mean that you don't have financial advisors out there who think that they do have fiduciary duties and that's how they operate their business, and they would therefore pick the mutual fund that pays 1%. So it's important to ask them that question. But in terms of the accepted industry standard, the standard suitability for a financial advisor, for somebody who's regulated by FINRA. A investment advisor, on the other hand, does generally have a fiduciary duty to you. So that's something that would be a pro for an investment advisor because generally speaking, that's their obligation to you. And so when they're making a recommendation, not only does it have to be suitable, but it's also got to be in your best interest. So in, the, in that same example, an investment advisor would be required to make the recommendation of the mutual fund that fits your needs and has the lower commission. The next big difference is, is how they're generally compensated. Um, in, in the brokerage firm context, the ones that are registered by or regulated by FINRA, uh, again, your Morgan Stanleys, your, your Merrill Lynch's, your uh, Smith Barney, etc. Uh, in that context, there, there's sort of two models. Uh, there's commission base, which is transactional base. They make a recommendation, you agree, you buy it, and then you pay them a commission for the recommendation. Or there's the assets under management model, which is you have a portfolio of a million dollars and you pay your broker 1%. And so they take 1% of the average of the portfolio. And the theory behind that one is that that gives your financial advisor a motivation to sort of be on the same team with you. Let's grow this portfolio because if you grow it, you'll get paid more. Um, but in, in the brokerage firm context, you could get either and you're going to have to have that conversation with your advisor to figure out which one you're getting. Um, in the investment advisor relationship, it is generally a asset center management model. Um, it's not typically commission based. Um, again, it, in terms of what's better for you, it really depends on the type of portfolio that you're constructing. Um, if you're a retired investor who doesn't trade much and just buys and holds and you know is looking for some income, maybe the commission based approach would be better uh, because maybe you're only doing two or three trades a year. Uh, and you don't want to be paying 1% for talking to your broker, you know, two or three times. Um, if you're more involved, more active, uh, maybe the assets under management approach is better for you because if you were paying commissions every time you traded, that would add up uh, to far more than the 1%. So in terms of which is more appropriate, it really depends on you. But in terms of who you're dealing with, whether it be financial advisor or investment advisor, that's the two differences that you'll typically see in terms of wh what you're probably getting. If you're with an investment advisor, you're probably getting some sort of, you know, number based on your assets. And if you're with a financial advisor, it may be more of a commission-based model. So you need to ask that question. Um, the, the other difference is, uh, and, and this to me is per perhaps more significant, because whether it's a financial advisor or an investment advisor is not going to be a initial indicator of, of good or bad. 
Uh, there are there are good financial advisors, bad financial advisors, and there's good investment advisors and bad ones. So, uh, to, which they are is really not like an indicator of okay, this is a good one. This is a financial advisor. This is the one I want. Um, but where you do get into perhaps a meaningful difference is in the litigation context. Um, the, the, if a financial advisor is registered through FINRA, and because of that, they are beholden to some of the FINRA rules, which includes litigation. Uh, if you have a dispute with your financial advisor, typically in the agreement somewhere there is language that says you agree to waive your right to sue us in court, and instead you have to th sue us through what used to be called the NASD and which is what is now called FINRA. And so if you have a relationship with a financial advisor regulated by FINRA, that's where your dispute's going to be heard. It's going to be heard through FINRA. And there's some advantages to that relative to investment advisors. Number one, it's obligatory. You can't be with a financial advisor who sort of doesn't respond to a FINRA dispute and throws up their hands and says, ha you can't get to me. Uh, FINRA has protections in place for advisors, or for investors, excuse me, that allows for, if you get an award against a financial advisor or brokerage firm, they don't pay it within 30 days, they lose their license, they're out of the business. And so that is a huge protection and a huge hammer that requires these guys or girls to show up and defend themselves because if they don't they know they could lose their license and so that is in my view a very huge protection and a, and a pro in terms of the financial advisor versus investment advisor if you're talking about bad outcome if you're talking about hey this could go bad and I want to be protected you are typically better off with a financial advisor because you've got more protection there in the investment advisor context the ones who are regulated by the SEC they don't have that same default um, you know, this is where the case is going to be heard. Instead, what, what I've seen is the investment advisor draws up an agreement and the litigation forum, they're, they're usually going to get you to waive your right to court, particularly if they're smart. Um, and if they're really smart, they're going to put in some sort of arbitration agreement that is extremely onerous on you. Uh, and by that, I mean, they're going to pick a forum that's very expensive. They'll often pick a venue that's, that's, uh, difficult for you to get into. I, I've, I've seen these agreements for investment advisory firms where the process that's selected is what's called JAMS. JAMS is a very expensive arbitration forum, mostly because the arbitrators in that forum are retired judges and you're paying them by the hour, their hourly rate. And so it can add up. You can have an arbitration in JAMS that could cost $50,000 just in arbitration fees. And investment advisors, if they're savvy enough, know that. And so they know that the threshold of cases that will be brought through jams is very high. You're not going to bring a $100,000 loss in a, in a forum where the fees might be $50,000. The other thing that they'll do in those types of agreements is they'll pick a venue that's not where you live. They'll say that it's mandatory that you file in Los Angeles and maybe you live in Atlanta, making it that much more difficult for you to bring the claim. And so that, that is, uh, to me, a very fundamental difference between the, the two and certainly, if you're talking to an investment advisor, pay very close attention to their agreement in total, but certainly the litigation aspect of it in terms of where the claim can be brought, because that, that hopefully the relationship goes fine. But if it goes bad, you don't want to be stuck in a situation where you're calling around to lawyers and no one will bring the case because the fees are too expensive in the arbitration form that's, that's required per the agreement. So that, that's a very fundamental difference. The other, the other difference between the two, and, and, and this again goes more into the litigation context, but um, in my experience, brokerage firms, it's a lot easier for lawyers like myself to figure out collectability. Um, generally speaking, if you're a FINRA registered broker, still, uh, still registered, you're going to have an incentive to try to resolve the case, and it's for the same reason I mentioned before. Uh, if you don't resolve the case, FINRA will take your license within 30 days. And so if you're still operating as a brokerage firm, still making revenue in the industry, that's not something you're going to want. And so you are typically going to respond to a FINRA complaint, try to either resolve it, or if you lose, you're generally going to pay, unless it's just reached that point where you just don't have the money to do so. In the investment advisory context, it's more complicated. You don't have that same hammer. The SEC doesn't step in and shut them down if they don't pay an award. Um, and so it's, it's more difficult, number one, to, uh, to, to force them to pay. 
And it's also more difficult for lawyers to sort of vet them and figure out whether or not there is an ability to pay. And so you end up in situations, at least with, with, with respect to my firm, where I am much more apt to bring a claim against a FINRA registered broker dealer than I'm not. And so, again, I'm, I'm looking worst case scenario and the reality is worst case scenario might be one, two, maybe even 5% of the time are you going to be in a situation where you even need to sue your financial advisor or your investment advisor. But if you're vetting somebody, and that's what we talked about last week, hey, we're, let's vet our financial advisor. Let's pick the right one. That's something that you probably should be considering. What is the likelihood of this going bad? And if it does, how am I protected? Uh, and to me, that's a big difference between financial advisors and investment advisors is that generally speaking, if you're involved with a financial advisor and it goes bad, your ability to find remuneration through a lawsuit is much better than if you're dealing with an investment advisor. So certainly something to consider. That's some of the differences. When we get back, we're going to go to a break here soon. Uh, but when we get back, I'm going to talk about how there's another wrinkle and there's another type of, of person out there who might be selling you investments that's neither a financial advisor or an investment advisor, making it that much more complex, but I'll try to bring some clarity to it. Beachling Cleaning Service has grown to become the area's premier janitorial service provider. Our service area extends from Melbourne through Fort Lauderdale. Our staff has more than 80 years combined industry experience. They're skilled, technically trained professionals who undergo continuing education so they can provide service that exceeds industry standards. Experience the difference. Call us today, 569-0799. Beachling Cleaning is a member of the iTex trading community. Your iTex dollars are welcome. History. History is the best predictor of the future. I've seen many times in history, civilizations repeat the same problems, same history had been done previous civilizations over and over again, each time failing. The best predictor of the future is a history. MrJustThinking.com Finally, it's arrived in Bureau. A1A Fingerprints comes to you. Are you a nurse, CNA, child care worker, massage therapist, school volunteer, realtor, or lawyer? The state of Florida requires a fingerprint background check for your state licensure and renewals. We make it easy with walk-in, same-day service and no appointment necessary. If you are a health care facility, we'll come to you and screen all your new hires with the fastest turnaround time and also bring your current staff up to date. In a recent law expansion, all massage therapists must now be fingerprint background checked effective July 1st, 2014. Visit a1afingerprints.com or call 772-494-6556. We're here to make your fingerprinting easy. A1A Fingerprints. If you're a healthcare facility, we'll come to you saving your employees the trip. We have same day mobile services available. a1afingerprints.com. Welcome back to Wall Street versus Main Street. I'm your host, Dax White. Uh, before the break, we talked about some of the differences between financial advisors and investment advisors, and there are some nuanced but significant differences between the two. Uh, to add to that complexity uh, is another wrinkle, which is, is, is the insurance salesperson. Um, they're not necessarily a financial advisor or an investment advisor, and it depends on the product, um, and it's another just uh, wrinkle in terms of finding out who am I dealing with. Uh, I want to make sure I understand who they're regulated by, and, and most importantly, make sure that they are being regulated in a way that protects you. Um, and in terms of the sh insurance salesperson, it depends on the type of product that they're offering to you. Um, if we're talking term insurance or whole insurance or things like that, that's just a straight insurance person. There's not an investment component to that. And so they're going to be regulated by the state agency that regulates insurance people. Uh, but the context I'm talking about has to do more with annuities uh, because there are a lot of people out there who sell annuities and put themselves out there as insurance. But if they're selling a t certain type of annuity, they're really they're selling an, an investment. Um, and so that's where it becomes more important in terms of who's regulating that person now. Um, and, and the big difference has to do with are they selling a fixed annuity or a variable annuity. A fixed annuity is where you invest you know, $100,000 in a product. It pays a fixed amount in terms of a return. It's got some death benefits and some other features to the, to the investment. 
but there's no variability to it in terms of investment performance. It's fixed. It tells you, here's the schedule. Here's what it's going to pay. That's not an investment. That, that's an insurance product um, that has certain protections and guarantees for you that, they, that it will pay that set amount. A variable annuity, on the other hand, has sub-accounts, which are invested typically in mutual funds and is very much an investment. And so if you are working with somebody who is selling you a variable annuity, they need to be registered either with FINRA or with the SEC, um, but they are offering you an investment. So it's not enough for them to have just an insurance license regulated by the state. So if you are dealing with somebody who's offering you that type of product, you need to ask the question and make sure they've got the proper registration. Because again, in those worst case scenarios where it goes bad, you want to have recourse. You want to have the ability to do something about it. It's much more difficult if you have somebody who's offering an investment they're not registered for. Um, you know, you're not going to have that same protection. You're certainly not going to have that same oversight. So uh, in, in terms of the, the insurance salesperson, that's where that nuance difference comes in. And, and, it, and it, if you're talking about a variable annuity that has any kind of investment component, that's the question you need to ask on that one. Um, if, if you're not, again, if you're talking term or, or whole or even a fixed annuity, um, then, then there's no investment component. There's no like worst case scenario, the market corrects and we lose all of our money in annuity. Um, you know, it, it's just a, you pay a, you pay a premium and, and you get the features of the uh, insurance product that's being offered. So, um, that's sort of the difference of that. That's that third wrinkle. Um, you know, the, the reality is some of these professionals are registered for all of them. They're registered to sell insurance. They're registered as an investment advisor through the SEC and they're registered as a financial advisor through FINRA. Um, I don't know if that makes that, that type of person the best for you. Um, but certainly you've got more oversight there. They're, now they're being regulated by state agencies that for, on insurance. They're being regulated by the SEC, and they're being regulated by FINRA. So in terms of regulation, in terms of oversight, maybe that is the best. But, um, but it is important to understand the differences and to ask those questions so that you know who you're getting involved with and make sure that you know that they're registered the way that they say they are. If they're selling you an investment, make sure they're registered to do so um, and make sure that they're getting the right oversight. So... Uh, some parting thoughts on all of this, you know, the, again, there's, there's upsides and downsides to these various nuances. Uh, you know, certainly an investment advisor who has that fiduciary duty to you is a, a significant thing. Um, you know, frankly, most investors who are working with a professional assume that they have this fiduciary duty when unfortunately they don't always have one. And so with an investment advisor, you are getting that. Uh, that's just an important question to ask regardless, but but that's certainly a pro in my view for investment advisors. Um, but there's some cons too. When you, Again, when you get into the agreement, the litigation forum, uh, the difficulty in bringing claims, uh, the collectability, uh, you know, there's just a lot of really small investment advisory firms out there. And there's some huge ones too, but there's some teeny tiny ones where if you sue them, they go under. Um, and in and, and my view, I mean, if... if my mom calls and says, you know, who should I invest with? Uh, you know, the first thing you want to do is make sure you're investing with the right person. But behind that, you got to have the right company. And, and, and what you want is a company that can, is going to be there even when things go bad. Uh, if they've got a, somebody who's working for them who does the wrong thing, you want to be able to, to sue a firm that's going to have the ability to, to make good, to come into that situation and say, you know what, we screwed up and we're going to own up to it. Um, and so, you know, those are, those are things to consider again, when you're, when you're looking into who to go with. Um, and, and those are my parting thoughts. If you've got questions, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, visit our website at wallstreetvmainstreet.com. Uh, you can also visit us on Twitter or Facebook, or you can even visit our firm website, which is whitesecuritieslaw.com. Uh, on, on, on Wall Street v. Main Street, you're going to see a ton of resources for, that I think are important for investors. So please check those out uh, and tune in next week, uh, Wednesdays at 4. You've been listening to Wall Street versus Main Street. The views expressed by the participants of the program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, the White Law Group, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, nor any of its subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.